Um, and, um, and if the Brookhaven study is to be believed, could could kill you know more than a hundred thousand people as a result. Hmm. And and this from the effects of radiation or long term cancer exposures. Something we'll get into in a minute. Yeah, hot particles uh, from long term cancer exposure. Okay. So so we've had these four units. Each of them has sort of had their own crisis, and each of them has has released um, contamination into the environment. First. How much contamination really got released here? Uh, second, you know, we we see that a bunch of it's headed into the ocean, although we're we're still, you know, I think questioning how much is where it all is. So my question is around how much contamination is is around these buildings at this point in time, and and you know what are the challenges, and what happens when not not if but when typhoon season comes up? Say we had a, a sort of a large onshore kind of a storm, you know, would that create sort of issues? I'm just trying to play out how much how much has been released how much might be released and, and what it actually implies at this point in time? Well, this, this event is, um, I've said it's worse than Chernobyl, and I'll, I'll stand by that. Um, there, there was an enormous amount of, um, of radiation given out in um, the first two, two, three weeks of the event. And had the wind been blowing inland, this would be, uh, it could very well have brought the nation of Japan to its knees. I mean, it was... Uh, there's so much contamination that luckily wound up in the Pacific Ocean compared to across the, uh, the the nation of Japan. It could have cut Japan in half. But now the winds have turned, you know, so they're heading to the south toward Tokyo. And, uh, you know, my concern and my advice to, to friends is that if there's a severe aftershock and the Unit 4 building collapses, leave. Um, there's, we're well beyond where any science has ever gone at that point, and uh, nuclear fuel lying on the ground and getting hot is not a, a condition that um, anyone has ever analyzed. So the the, the plants, you'll, you'll see them steaming, and, and as, as the summer goes on, you'll see them steaming less because the air is warmer. But it's not because they're, they're not steaming. You just don't see it because... This event occurred in March, and it was cool there, so you'll see a plume a lot easier. Those um, plants are still emitting um, a lot of radiation, nowhere near as much as on the first two weeks, but a lot of radiation, cesium, strontium, and um, mainly cesium and strontium. Those are going to head south, whether or not there's a, a, a hurricane, tropical hurricane. Um, the wind is going to push it south this time, and uh, so the issue is... Um, not the total radiation you might measure with a Geiger counter in your hand, but um, but hot particles. Well, there was already I, I you know was taken aback when I read the reports that um, in some prefectures right around Tokyo they'd found some what I consider to be pretty hot readings, um, you know three or four thousand becquerels in the soil, one hundred seventy thousand becquerels in in some kind of a fly ash or or they they found some in sludge as well, but I think the higher reading was from some sort of ash, which means it came through an incinerator or, or some sort of burning process. I thought those were pretty shocking levels because uh, I hadn't really been informed that that the winds had shifted south long enough and enough contamination had made it that far in order to get readings like that. So I felt um, uh, fairly confused, as if I, I didn't have a good understanding of how much might have gotten there or how it got there or when it got there, and that they'd found those readings in March, and of course they didn't release the data until uh, sometime in, towards the end of April. Um, did you follow that part, and, and, and what do you make of readings like that? Um, yes, I followed it, and I, I am as confused as you are. Individuals have sent, uh, have sent Fairwind some car air filters from, from Tokyo, and they turn out to be one of the ideal ways of measuring radiation because uh, you know, they trap a lot of these hot particles. And we had one person sent us seven filters, and they ran a body shop or something, and, and Five of the filters were fine, and two were incredibly radioactive. So what that tells me is that the, the plume was not regular. And you'll have places where there was um, not much deposition, and you'll have places where there was a lot of deposition. Um, that same thing happened up to the north, but um, within Tokyo, uh, it seems like wherever the official results were being reported, um, didn't really represent the um, the worst conditions of the plume. And I saw that on Three Mile Island. We shouldn't be surprised that a plume meanders and that a plume um, may miss a, a, a major radiation detector by um, you know a, a quarter of a mile, and it's not detected. doesn't mean it's not there. 
it means we just didn't detect it. Sure, it's it, this is a uh, fluid dynamics. You know, when you when you put a, a drop of dye in a glass of water and watch it swirl around. Obviously, it, it more ends up in some places than others. So that's part of it. And anybody's looked at the uh, the after map of Chernobyl all across Belarus and, and and Ukraine and whatnot. I mean, it's it's obviously not a a big circle. <laughs> it's a very very um, convoluted map of of deposition. So that that's part of it. I guess I was surprised because I hadn't heard of any warning signs that that amount could have been de um, deposited that far south yet and there but there it was so um, that was pretty interesting to me what, what happened there was the plume went out to sea but then curved south and then and then west it actually c came in like a hook um, so that uh, you know when you were measuring what was happening at, at Fukushima it appeared that the plume was heading out to sea but then uh, offshore the winds took it south and then west into into um, Tokyo, um, and it contained, um, the, the particles we're picking up in air filters are you know, strontium and cesium and uh, americium, which is a, 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 an indication of, um, of fuel failures. Right, and maybe that was the same plume that I remember um, uh, was Korea, South Korea, actually shut some schools down because it was raining at the time and they had a lot of radiation coming down. So we know that there was a big south and then west hooking in order for it to get there, so maybe that was... That was part of that that one process, um, but it it speaks to something which is that these plumes that are coming up and out of contaminated plumes with radioactive particles in them are, are pretty hot, um, a, as you might expect. I remember the 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 reactor that was scaring me the most for a while was was number two, which looked sedate. It had this little hole in the side, but it was just it was just constantly emitting steam constantly um, for a whole period of time, and I knew what was in that steam. It was uh, it was going to be pretty hot. I thought unit two has gotten to the point where. It can't get any worse because it's now laying at the bottom of a containment, and the containment has a hole in it. That doesn't mean that it's it's not really bad. Still, it just can't get any worse. Um, the the concern uh, now is this enormous amount of water that's being used to cool these reactors. You know, tens of tons an hour, and the the original plan was to recirculate the nuclear reactor water through the nuclear reactor and on the other side have a heat exchanger that took the heat away. So you wouldn't generate any water. In fact, we've got hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive water. And it's not mildly radioactive. And here's the problem. The, um, the, if you were to demineralize this or filter this, the filters and demineralizers would become so radioactive that they, the filters might melt because they're made of a plastic material. And the other part of it is that the personnel couldn't get near the filters to change them. Um, so it's a very difficult problem. What do you do with all of this contaminated water? The large volume and the high radioactivity make, um, make getting rid of that water very difficult. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about the other challenges they face, too. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with all that water, and I don't think they do either. They're pumping it into a big storage tank right now, and I just read that maybe that's leaking, or at least some water went out of it, so one guess is it's leaking. Um, talk to us about, about what are the other challenges that those engineers and cleanup crews are going to be facing? What, what's the work environment like there right now? Yeah, we are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the people outside are are wearing completely um, enclosed um, clothing taped to their faces and they have respirators on um, the respirators are designed you know as a charcoal filter but they're breathing through their lungs and they're taking the air from the outside through those respirators um, it's hot it's sticky and you're constantly looking at this radiation gauge but um, it's something that um, while uncomfortable, probably isn't um, isn't lethal. The the people that are going in are are a different problem. Um, they're going in in a, essentially a bubble suit, and um, they have their own self-contained air, like a fireman in a in a fire a Scott air pack is sort of what they're they're called. So they're going in with their own self-contained air into a place that has no lights, into a place that has um, water everywhere that in a place that's dark um, with um, with rubble and on top of that it's highly radioactive and they're probably carrying 30 or 40 pounds worth of gear to do whatever it is they were sent in there for um, the stay time in that environment um, it, it would be tough if there were no radiation it's a hot sticky pretty mm. miserable place to work for for an hour or so 
but the radioactivity levels are so high that these guys are being chased out on the order of you know 15 minutes and they're receiving an exposure which is roughly equivalent to um, the, the worst an American worker would get over five years these guys are picking up in 10 minutes mm. so let's assume that that they do actually have the I think they've bumped it up to 250 millisieverts um, as a as an annual dose limit now so so once a worker gets to say that that threshold then what hopefully they they are no longer allowed to receive any more radiation um, period for the not just for a year or for a month but they, they really shouldn't receive any more than that um, here's the a general rule of thumb is 250 rem um, will will kill you so that means that if 10 people get 25 rem one of them will develop a cancer and if 100 people get 2.5 rem one of them will get a cancer so it doesn't mean lesser can lesser doses um, assure you of not getting a cancer so what these people are doing is they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer um, 250 millisieverts is 25 rem, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, but they're increasing the likelihood, every time they pick up that exposure, they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer by 10%. Right. And, and so, uh, gosh, I read some of the readings that I saw um, in, in there are pretty scary hot readings. Um, so, so they're definitely all the way up. Um, in the one sievert zone for for some of the some of the areas and some are hotter and all of that so so we've got these damaged buildings they're sending people in my concern has been that you know there are only so many people who are trained to work in those facilities so they know them know them well knew the systems know that know the parts know how to even navigate the hallways um, once they've gone through and used up their allotment of, of radiation um, exposure I, I, I they're done right and then I guess they train the next people to go in and uh, one thing that's concerned me is I know that when Chernobyl went uh, you know Russia it just threw hundreds of thousands of people at it um, in small little bits and, and to clean that up here we're seeing a very different response it's much more measured um, they're relatively small teams by my eye I, I, I look at satellite photos I don't see hundreds of thousands of people converging on that um, I see uh, a pretty focused response uh, how long is it going to take with a focused response like that um, to get this job done, do you think? The, the Russians needed thousands of people because large fragments of the fuel <clears throat> had fallen on the surrounding farmland. So literally people would pick up a fragment in a wheelbarrow and, uh, and run toward where the reactor was, uh, throw that fragment into the reactor pit, and they were, they were done. They had received their lifetime exposure. Um, in, in this case, um, the, while the, the radiation is not contained, um, it's not coming out of solid particles that can get picked up. It's coming out of liquid. So it's a, the, the Woods Hole has already said that uh, um, the ocean has 10 times more radiation from, uh, from Fukushima than the Black Sea did from, um, from Chernobyl. So the, the Chernobyl reaction with a large staff of people it was because it sort of blew up. And the Fukushima reaction, while it did blow up, a lot of it is going down, and we're just beginning to deal with it. They're, they're importing workers from the U.S. already, and I suspect they, they, um, they will again. I was in the business. I, as a vice president, I would hire people to work in very high radiation zones. Then we would train them for uh, two or three weeks in a mock-up, and then they'd have three minutes in a high radiation zone to do what we trained them for. And that would be their, their yearly exposure. And we'd give them a check and say, thank you very much. See you next year. Um, and that's what will happen here at, at, uh, at Fukushima. So talk to us about, um, realistically, uh, I, I mean, this is going to be months, years, whatever. It's going to take a long time. Uh, what do they do at this point? Are they going to entomb these things? Do they have to, are they required to just keep dumping water on these things until they finally cool down, capturing water all the way through? Or is there is there some way that they can maybe just, throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. 